hey, so it's June. So what does June mean? That means we have the summer solstice. So we'll talk about that and see one of the days are long and the nights are short. And also, it's a favorite time of year to start observing. We have more clear skies, warm nights, and then we're also going to show you a few things that you can look at from your own backyard. So grab your favorite astronomy app and say Google Sky, Sky View Light, uh, Skywalk 2, uh, just to name a few. And there's the list right there. So I encourage you to download and try them out because it contains a lot of useful information. And then grab skymap.com for the month of June. Then you'll see the highlights right there that you can use while observing the nighttime sky. And then grab your favorite planet sphere. And take all of that and let me show you what some of the things that we'll see for the month of June. Now let's take a look at the highlight for the June night sky. And anytime you want to learn about the nighttime sky, you want to get your compass bearing. And many of you will be looking at the nighttime sky from your home or from your own backyard, which means it could be from the city. So what you'll notice that from the cities, you won't see as many stars as you would out in the rural areas where the skies are much darker. But in any case, if you want to go out and find your compass bearing, the first step you should do is try to find a Big Dipper. And in the month of June, before midnight, the Big Dipper is high above the northern horizon. There's seven stars right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And each of these stars are about the magnitude of two. Give you an idea. So hopefully from your viewing point, you'll be able to see all of these seven stars of the Big Dipper. And show it to you right there. And there's the Big Dipper. And then the constellation called Ursa Major, referred to as the Great Bear in the Sky. And so, first step is to find the Big Dipper. Then take these two end stars of the bowl of the Big Dipper and draw an imaginary line until you come to this star right here called Polaris. From our location in Portland, Polaris is roughly about 45 degrees above the northern horizon. So that means it's 45 degrees off the equator, and it's halfway up the sky. So that shows you our latitude. And Polaris is about a magnitude of 2. It's 432 light years away. This is our pole star, the star that sits above the Earth's north pole. So the Earth turns on its axis of rotation. You'll notice that all of these stars in this region right here, okay, they stay above the horizon. Let me show you that uh, kind of in this fashion. Okay, so if we move forward, you notice how Polaris is right above the horizon. Okay, and say so uh, where it is. But you see these constellations closest to Polaris stay above the horizon. That's called circumpolar region. Right? Let me back back up just about here and where we were. Okay. And so now you have found north. The sun is set in the northwest, so you have found west. And then opposite, opposite to the west is east, and then behind you is south. And so we have Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and then down here, one, two, three, four, five, is the letter W. That is the constellation of Cassiopeia, referred to as the Queen. Right? That's right here. Okay? And so there's the five stars, Cassiopeia. Now from the city, uh, you won't, it'd be kind of hard to see, but uh, from rural areas and what have you, this is a good way to find the plane of the Milky Way. So you find Cassiopeia, and then there's Cygnus the Swan, which we'll get to. And right along here, you would find the plane of the Milky Way. Okay? So these stars here in Cassiopeia, let me get a little bit darker, so show up now. There we go. Okay? And in Cassiopeia, the stars are roughly about uh, two as well. Okay? So we have north right there, and then you have Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. 
in Cassiopeia. So this is a good way to start off when you're learning about the nighttime sky. So we're going to go back now facing toward the south. Okay, and there's a nice bright moon right there. And well, let me get back to that in just a minute. But now I want to take the moment to talk about the summer solstice that's coming up. And the summer solstice in 2020 will occur on June 20th at 2.43 p.m. Pacific time. And at that point in time, that's when, if you look at this diagram right here, the sun will be directly over the Tropic of Cancer. Right? And then up in the Northern Hemisphere, you'll notice that this is called the Terminator, that the days are going to be longer than the nights. And the North Pole is leaning toward the sun. Where in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the opposite. They're heading towards, towards the winter. Their days are short and the nights are long. And that's what we had to find as the summer solstice. Right? So on that day, we're going to have about 15 hours and 41 minutes of daylight. Okay? So you'll notice as you, the evenings are getting uh, later and later, and the nights are short. Okay? So let me show you what happened here. If we go forward here, uh, facing south, at that point of time during that day, during the day, the sun will be about 68 degrees above the southern horizon. Our latitude location is 45. So you take 45 degrees plus 23 and a half degrees with the earth tilt. And you have 68 degrees. So on that day, that's when the sun is reached its highest point. And because it's nearly overhead, the sun has more chance to heat up the air above the ground, meaning 15 hours from the time it rises from the east, and it takes 15 hours, less than 16, to be able to uh, concentrate the energy in the, on the surface, the air above the ground. Uh, that's what caused them, we noticed in the summertime, the temperature to rise. Okay? Now, as we move forward, Okay, and we see that as we go forward, you see the motion of the sun. And when we go forward, that you see that uh, if we go into the evening, that the evenings are pretty short. Okay? And so it's one of the uh, least favorite time of year for astronomers because they don't really have a lot of time to be able to observe the nighttime sky. And so we see a lot of sunlight and daylight Many people are pretty happy that it's summer finally. And so uh, let me show you what happened as we go forward. Then you'll see uh, the example. So here's the sun. And we're leaving this market at 68 degrees to remind you of the height. The sun sets in the northwest. Okay? And then if we go through the night. It comes back over here in the northeast. Right? And so that's why we have this angle that the sun appears to be in the sky much longer. And then it's back at 68 degrees. And so that's what contributes to our solstice. And now let's go back to the southern part of the sky. And there are a lot of fun things to look at. Um, by the way, I'm going to talk about the moon while we're at it. Here it is, uh, June 5th. Okay. And here's the moon. The full moon for the month of June occurs on the 5th. And this is known as the strawberry moon. Now I want to show you something. If you go toward the south. Okay. Remember on uh, the solstice sun, it was 68 degrees. The full moon in the month of of June, it's at its lowest point uh, during the year. The moon makes its highest point in December, and the sun is at its lowest point in December for the winter solstice. For the summer solstice, it's the opposite, kind of like a teeter-totter. So the moon on June 5th will be at its lowest point of only 23 degrees. Right? You also notice that 
The moon, as you're looking at it, has kind of a champagne color. And it's known as the honeymoon. It's in the month of June, it's the strawberry moon. But it's usually remembered during the month of June and July. And with a lot of weddings that we have honeymoons. And that's where the many memories are made that during the honeymoon, they remember looking at the moon, it had that champagne color. So another way you look at it too is at, on the full moon in June. You have 45 degrees for our latitude. And then you take 23 and a half. You get about 23 degrees. So on the 5th of June, we'll have the full moon. And then the new moon for June will be on June 20th, the same time at the solstice. That, that, that's pretty rare. Right? So uh, we'll have the full moon on June 5th. So let me back up where we kind of started here, where we left off. Okay, and now we're going to go back, back up just a little bit, okay, and facing towards the south. For the rest of the evening, we're going to move from west to south to east. And I'm going to show you a few highlights here. Okay. Find the Big Dipper right here. And then we're going to use the Big Dipper as a guide. Here's the bowl right there. Go straight down and you'll see a bright star. And that star right there is called Regulus. This is the heart of Leo the Lion. It's on a magnitude of 1.32. It's fairly bright. And it's about 80 light years away. This is a red giant star. It's pretty easy to spot. So let me put the constellations back up. Here's the Big Dipper. It's a guide. Go right down here. You have Regulus. Regulus is recognized as one of the zodiacal signs along the ecliptic. Okay, so uh, this is the path where the sun takes and you find the planets along this uh, region here. So we have the Big Dipper, there's Regulus, and you find it back with question mark, right at the base is Regulus. Regulus, by the way, is a red giant star. And then over here at the tail, this is the nebula. The nebula is about 2.1 magnitude, about 36 light years away. And this is referred to as the tail of an animal. Cygnus the Swan had Deneb, and Leo had the nebula. And so we have the two bright stars of Leo, the lion. It's pretty easy to find right underneath the, uh, the bowl of the Big Dipper. And I want to move back over here toward the west for the moment and back up just slightly. And just when the sun was setting, okay, and to show you what's going on over in the west. Okay. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, and in the month of June, okay, see, there it is right there. I'm going to show you these guys right about here. Okay. Now, in the month of June, it's kind of hard to see with the uh, glare. Okay. There's Venus. People have been wondering, where's Venus? Well, Venus uh, just made an a, uh, inferior conjunction on June 3rd. So I can actually back up a little bit. And there it is. Okay. So, inferior conjunction is just the end of the diagram that just means that Venus is in between the Earth and the Sun. So it reaches inferior conjunction. So for a long time in, in 2020, we have Venus putting on quite a show in the evening. Now just past uh, inferior conjunction, and it will become a morning object uh, in just a few days or weeks. Okay? So I wanted to show you that, and then what's also in the evening, it's just starting to appear, is Mercury. Mercury is a challenge, okay? There's Mercury right there, and Mercury 
okay, is um, at what we call the longest elongation on the fourth. Okay, so we just back up one day. There it is. Okay, Mercury the challenge uh, because it's always it's a, first of all uh, the closest planet to the sun. It's at a magnitude of about zero, which is about the brightness of Vega. Okay. And at this time, um, it is about a 36% phase, so not quite half. But you have to find Venus, if you want to find Venus, you have to be right there at sunset. Okay. And wait, you must wait until the sun is below the horizon. And then you slowly will see Venus emerge. We have Castor and Pollux here, these two stars. And then right below that is the planet Mercury. Mercury is the, technically the smallest planet in the solar system. It has no atmosphere. Uh, it's nothing more than a bright dot And when you look at the view of a Mercury. But if you want a challenge, make sure that the sun is set below the horizon and then look towards the general direction of the northwest. I've got a big tree in this graphic here, so it's hard to show, but you just have to be right there above the uh, northwest horizon like this, and it will only last for just maybe an hour, and then you just get right above the horizon. Okay, so that would be a fun challenge is to try to find Mercury. But that is the only planet now in the West. Okay. So now let's go back to the South. We covered Leo already. Okay. And I want you to remember this phrase, art to art curious, speed down the spica. So we're going to use the Big Dipper again, the arc to, the handle the arc, to Art Curious, the star right there. It's a huge red giant star. It's about a magnitude of, of zero. Uh, it's about 37 light years away. It's a huge red giant star. One of the first stars to appear after sunset. And this is in the constellation known as Buzis. Okay, It's kind of an ice cream shape or a kite. Okay, so there's Art Curious right there. And you go one, two, three, four, five, and connect the dots. You have what looked like an ice cream cone. Okay? There's Leo, there's Booty. So art to art curious. Okay? And then followed by be down or spike down the spica. So art to art curious, be down to spica. And spica is a hot blue white star. And looking at spica. It's in the constellation of Virgo. Virgo is one of the largest constellations of the nighttime sky. It's also one of the zodiacal signs. Okay? And so Virgo is seen as the maiden or a wheat barrier. Booty is seen as uh, a, uh, the herdsman. Okay? So check this out. Remember the step. Art to art curious. Be down the spica. So you find these two bright stars way underneath. Okay. Now I want to show you a fun little constellation that's worth looking at. Okay. I'm going to show you kind of a, a highlight. Okay. While you're over there, right here, you see these group of stars. Okay. This is a necklace. And this is a constellation called Coma Berenices. And this is referred to right there. There's what looked like a diamond. Now, and this is up back here. And this is the one that's about 75 light years away. But this is seen at the imagination of uh, a diamond. And this is what we refer to as uh, the hair of Queen Berenice of Egypt. Okay. So that's the fun one to, uh, to talk about. Okay. So again, there's Arcurius. And then it looked like a diamond, a necklace right there. Okay. So now let's go back over here to Virgo. I'm going to talk about Virgo. And remember Virgo, there's Pica right there. Okay. And Virgo 
uh, here. It's in an area where it's rich um, galaxy. In fact, this is where we find in this region. I'm not sure if it's going to show up on this or not. Uh, let me go a little bit deeper into the night. Maybe I'll show up. Uh, but this area right here is known as the Diamond of Virgo. Right? And one way you can uh, find that, let me back up again. There's Arcurius again. There's Pica, right? And then the Nebula, the tail of an animal. Remember, find the Nebula again. Put that back up there. There's the Nebula. So if you connect these two, or three, right here would be the Diamond of Virgo. And this is an area where astronomers love to look at in the summertime. See if I can get anybody to show up. Look at those. There's, there they are. Okay, these M uh, number of Messier objects, okay, out of 110, it's the catalog. Okay, and you can see that it's an area rich of galaxies. So if you, like, say, let's say this one, M87, it's actually where we have our first picture of the black hole by Team Horizon uh, last year. And there's the galaxy, okay? It's a Virgo galaxy. Here's another galaxy. And here's another galaxy, okay? In this region, there are about roughly 65 or so galaxies. If you zoom in, look at that. Galaxies everywhere. NGC stands for National Journal Catalog. That's another catalog, thousand. So you zoom in, you have galaxies and galaxies everywhere. Okay? Most of them are spiral galaxy or bar galaxy. This is the reason that our Milky Way is part of the group, uh, the local group, and the, the Virgo cluster is part of that. Okay? So you can see if I zoom around, look at all those galaxies, okay? more galaxies. Okay? Most of these galaxies are roughly at a distance uh, and millions of light years away. Okay? And it just showed, kind of show you that I'm uh, looking at these, making these galaxies. That we, there are millions and even millions of millions of galaxies uh, throughout the universe, right? So, this is a fun thing to look at. Uh, they're faint, they're fairly faint. If you notice that some of these are magnitude of 8 or magnitude of 8. Here's another one a magnitude of 10. Okay? So, they're millions of light years away from us. So, when you look at these galaxies, looking at them that they were millions of years ago. So again, find Arcarius, Pica, the Nebula, and right that region is the Diamond of Virgo. Okay. So now let's go back to the Big Dipper. You take these three stars, one, two, three, and make an imaginary line until you come to the keystone pattern of stars. Again, we're using the Big Dipper and we're going to second, third, and fourth. Draw a straight line over here. Now we're looking at Hercules. It's seen at the keystone pattern of stars. Let me take this out and show you again. Okay. Now, let's see. Where's the Big Dipper? So right over here, you see the keystone pattern. Okay. And now we're looking at Hercules. Okay. And Hercules is a fun one. Uh, it's nearly overhead. It will be above your, uh, high above the horizon uh, during the summer. And, and we take a look at Hercules. See, it's the hero. Okay. And there's the leg. There's the arm. Okay. And while you're there, go right between these two stars, almost dead center. And you zoom in even more. There's M13, the great globular cluster. The bottom magnitude of six, which means it's right at the limit of the um, view of the human eye. But if you look at a binoculars or a telescope, this is what you would see. This is why it's the famous cluster. And you can zoom in, and now and you're looking at what looks like a bowl of diamond. And there's approximately half a million or even a million 
of stars. These are the first generation of stars that are orbiting around the bulls of the Milky Way. And this is one of many. But this one is, is the easiest one to find and has a magnitude of about six. And so definitely worth a look. And so you just take these two stars, almost center and just above that, uh, the best view with binoculars. And it would easily show up on your application if you're trying to find the cluster. Okay. So now let's continue on. And we're still facing toward the south. Okay. And what I want to do now is kind of move forward later into the evening. And if you get into the evening, this is now about midnight. So let me, not quite midnight. Okay, there we go. Okay, and I'll show you some of the highlights. Actually, I'm going to move forward into the month. There we go. It's 20th. Okay. And if you go into later into the month, you look toward the south. Now we're looking at some really fun object. We have Scorpion and Sagittarius. Let's take a look at this bright star right here. Okay, this star is known as Antares. This is the red giant star of the Scorpion. This is the heart of Scorpion. And it's about a magnitude of one, five hundred and fifty-three light years away from us. Okay, and so this is seen of the Great Scorpion. If you have a nice horizon, you can actually see why it's called the scorpion. You have the stinger, okay, and then moving up, you have the heart, then you have the head, okay, and then you can kind of see the pincher. Right in front of that is Libra, another zodiacal sign, okay, it only has one, two, three stars, it's just the scale, okay, so scorpion is definitely one worth looking at. And it's everybody's favorite in the summer nighttime sky. Right? And so that's one. Let's take that out. And you'll see without it, it's pretty bright. It's a nice red star. Okay. And then over here, if you use your imagination, what looks like a teapot. Okay. This is Sagittarius, or there you go. This is referred to as. Uh, what many people call is the uh, the archer, okay? And there's the handle, there's the belly, right there at the teapot, and there's the spout. Now, if we zoom in on that a little bit, okay, you notice that this area is rich, a uh, lot of deep sky objects, okay? There's everywhere, and there's a reason for that, okay? So, right about here, Okay, we're looking at the center of our Milky Way, which is located about 30,000 light years away from us. So just above the spout, look like steam coming out of the spout. Okay? And so you have all the fun objects uh, that you can use for uh, viewing the clusters and so on. If you see them getting closer, as you get closer, the more that you see. Okay? And you see that in this region, that it's pretty dense okay, with the star field. Okay? So right in that area, this is where you would find wonderful viewing. And even over in Scorpion right here, you have some clusters, M6, and butterfly, M7, Ptolemy's cluster, uh, clusters, just name it. And remember I said that Hercules cluster orbits around the center of the Milky Way, and there you could see even more okay, of these clusters orbiting around the center. Okay? Now you will notice something really bright over here. There's Ju Jupiter. Okay? And Jupiter is just now starting to emerge into the evening sky. It was a morning object, and now it's starting to appear. So just about uh, just after midnight or before midnight. You will find Jupiter. And Jupiter is at a magnitude of minus 2.3. That's really bright. And it's easy to spot. So let's zoom in and take a look at Jupiter. 
okay, the largest planet in the solar system. And in view of binoculars or telescope, you can actually see Jupiter, see the band. And the red spot would be in the southern hemisphere, but it's facing away from us right now. And then we have the four bright moons, Callisto, Europa, Io, and Ganymede. Okay? And these are the four Galilean moons. They're the easiest spot with binoculars or a telescope. For Jupiter, it only, only takes 10 hours to turn on its axis for a single day. But if you notice that if I go forward and backwards, whoop, yeah, we got to zoom in on that. There we go. Zoom in on Jupiter. Keep it centered. There we go. Okay, and that will keep Jupiter centered. If you go forward, look at Calista, Europa, and Ganymede. Okay, so they changed their position to Jupiter by the hour. So that makes it for fun viewing. Ganymede okay, is about a magnitude of about five, but Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. Okay? And so Ganymede right here, here we go, is one in the four Galilean moons. Now Jupiter has about roughly in the neighborhood of 78 moons total, but these are the four largest moons that are visible. Uh, from Earth. And there's Callisto, magnitude of 5, 6. Now, if you want to find uh, information where the moons are in relation to who's, uh, who's who, uh, use the application. I've seen an application that it actually identifies which moon is which. So that's Jupiter, and Jupiter is going to be in our evening sky uh, for next several months. Right? And then we have Saturn. Saturn is about zero magnitude, second largest planet in the solar system. You zoom in on it, okay, there is the ring. You can actually see the ring of Saturn because the, the planet is tilted about roughly 25 degrees towards the Earth. And you can actually see the plane of the ring of Saturn. Okay. And then Saturn has 82 moons, but the largest moon that's visible from the uh, Earth, with the human eye, is about a magnitude of nine, but in binoculars or telescope, it's pretty easy to spot. And so, you would find Titan, it's the largest moon in the solar system. And now you notice that when you look at Jupiter and Saturn, they're only going to be about five to six degrees apart. So they're going to put on quite a show uh, for the summer. So that's an easy object. To find. Remember, we're about roughly midnight uh, at this time. Okay, and then let's finish off right over here, and I'm going to show you what we refer to as the summer triangle. So there's Lyra, or Lyra. It's Vega, constellation of zero. It's about 20, 25 light years away, and then there's Deneb. I think that's a swan. Okay, Deneb, the tail of the animal. But we have Vega, Deneb, and then down here is a, not Aquila, but let's see if I can get that started to show up. Altair. Okay, there's Altair right there. Now, if you take these three, this is known as the Summer Triangle, which is actually an asterism. Okay? And so this is a, another fun object in this area to look at. And what we're looking at here is Lyra the Harp, Vega, one of the first stars to appear after sunset. There's Deneb, okay? And Deneb is also known as part of the constellation Cygnus the Swan, or referred to as the Northern Cross. And this star right here is called Alberio. Let's see if I can get it to show up. Alberio, the head of the swan. You have to get any closer. There it is, Alberio, and it's about a magnitude of 3.2. Um, it's about 434 light years away, and this is a fun object to look at, but particularly in binoculars telescope. It's a beautiful binary star. And when you look at it, you can actually see the blue and gold. 
uh, the stars that start far enough apart, you can actually see the color of a barrier and its binary star. Okay? So it would look something like this. Okay? So it's easy to find. Okay? And back up. Okay? And there we have the summer triangle. Okay? And now let's take you to the morning sky and go forward. So what's going on over here in the morning sky? Because for a long time, we had uh, Jupiter and Saturn. There's Mars. Mars is slowly, gradually making its way. There's Jupiter. There's Saturn. It's now roughly about 4.30 in the morning. It's before sunrise. There's Mars. Mars is the uh, red planet. And you're going to be hearing a lot about Mars in July. Okay, we're seeing, studying the rover called Perseverance. They're going to go to Mars, another visitor for the Mars program. Okay, so there's Mars, and then just starting to emerge over in the northeast is Venus. Gradually getting there. So way too low, but you'll you'll notice that in, as the, we get into the summer, that Venus is going to join with Mars as part of the morning sky. So go out and take a look at the June night sky.